why Marianne Backmeyer took justice into her own hands. On the 6th of May of 1981, in a half-empty courtroom at the district court of the picturesque German city of Lübeck, Marianne Backmeyer looked at the man who was on trial, a face she had seen in nightmares for months. Then she took out the Beretta M1934 she had smuggled to court and shot the man, Klaus Grabowski, on the back eight times. He died by the sixth shot. Why did Marianne shoot him? Because roughly a year earlier, Grabowski had killed her daughter. What drove Marianne to take justice into her own hands, and what would be the consequences she had to face? Marianne's History Marianne had a troubled and complicated childhood. Her father was a strict alcoholic who used to be part of the Waffen-SS, the military branch of the German Nazi party. When her father eventually left, it seemed Marianne would get a break from his abuse, but her mother promptly remarried to another abusive parent. Marianne was a free-spirited girl who didn't fit in within the conservative household. This caused a lot of conflict with her stepfather, a tyrant who beat her and humiliated her, and her mother blamed all the problems in the family on Marianne, driving her further away. Marianne first became pregnant when she was 16. She had the child, but made the difficult decision to give the baby up for adoption since she didn't have the means or possibility of raising him. Marianne again became pregnant at 18 years old, this time to her boyfriend. Although initially considering keeping him, she had a traumatic experience after giving birth that convinced her to also give this baby up for adoption. She left school a couple of years later and started working as a waitress at a restaurant called Tapasa, where she had an on-again, off-again relationship with the owner, Christian Berthold. She became pregnant by Christian soon after. She wanted to keep the baby this time, feeling she had the means to take care of her, but Christian didn't want to commit. So she decided to raise Anna, her daughter, by herself. Marianne was very loving through Anna's early childhood, but wasn't able to take care of her all the time. She would often take her to the bar, even at a very young age, and Tapasa's patrons grew to know and love Anna. But she often was also alone on the streets as her mother worked. Marianne even considered giving Anna up to foster parents at one point, approaching some neighbors about it, but nothing came of it. On the 5th of May of 1980, after Marianne and her daughter had a fight, Anna decided to not attend school. She wandered around town, attempting to visit a friend's house, but realizing she wasn't there. Then she headed back home. Anna wouldn't reach her own house that day. Marianne had slept in the apartment above Tapasa and had an afternoon photoshoot with the local newspaper about the unusual painted-on Volkswagen she owned. When she finally got home, there was no sign of Anna. She reported her missing by nightfall. The next afternoon, a distraught woman went to the police station, claiming that Klaus Grabowski, who was her fiancé, had confessed to killing a young girl who sometimes came into their apartment to play with their cat. The girl's name was Anna. The murder and the trial. When the police arrived at Grabowski's home, he was nowhere to be found. He had taken Anna's body and had left a note for his fiancée telling her to meet him at a bar that night to talk. The police waited at the bar and when Grabowski arrived, arrested him. Grabowski had a really troubled past. In 1973, he had assaulted a six-year-old girl and had been charged with attempted murder. Later in 1975, he was charged with sexual assault of two young girls. His psychological evaluation claimed he was addicted to an abnormal sexual instinct and that he was considerably limited in his ability to prevent it. Because of this evaluation, he was sent to a psychological treatment facility instead of to jail. A couple of years later, he was given the option to undergo a controversial procedure which would chemically castrate him or to remain more time in the institution. He chose the procedure and was released shortly after. There were no further psychological evaluations done. Two years later, Grabowski underwent a treatment to reverse the chemical castration and to increase his testosterone, ostensibly to start a family with his fiancée. 
At the time of the murder, his testosterone was at the same level as before the original procedure. When speaking with the police, Grabowski claimed that he hadn't improperly touched Anna, and that he had killed her after she had tried to extort him, saying she would accuse him of sexual abuse if he didn't give her money. Grabowski claimed that he then used his fiancée's stocking to strangle Anna. When the police told Marianne about her daughter's murder, she wasn't able to react. She was completely destroyed. At Anna's funeral some days later, she played Pink Floyd in the church. The trial started several unbearable months later. At the beginning of the trial, Marianne was forced to listen to testimonies and descriptions about her life and Anna's life. It was claimed that Anna practically grew up on the streets, that her mother was a waitress at a bar who worked late nights and did not care for her daughter. Marianne was heartbroken and angry. On the second day of the trial, Marianne apparently misheard a conversation between Grabowski and his attorney. She thought he would make a statement the next day, and knowing what he had claimed before about Anna, Marianne was not going to have it. Next day, in the half-empty courtroom, before it opened to the public, Marianne shot Grabowski in the back. He died right there. This became one of the most famous vigilante cases in Germany. A lot of the public supported Marianne's revenge on her daughter's killer, and during the trial that followed, part of the legal fees were paid by a donations fund in her name. The trial was highly publicized, and Marianne's face was plastered in all the newspapers. The bar to passer was scrutinized, and everything about Marianne's and Anna's life was subject of statements in court. In the end, she was sentenced to six years in prison for manslaughter. She was released after three years, a year and a half of those on suicide watch. Marianne moved to Lagos, Nigeria and married a German professor. Eventually, they got a divorce and she spent most of the rest of her life helping at a hospice in Sicily. When she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer at 46, she returned to Lübeck and a friend filmed the last weeks of her life before she was put to rest next to Anna.